I'm going to try to avoid the topological twists that we saw Robert do with the mic and the pointer. Let's see. Okay, great. <coughs> so uh, I'm going to switch gears uh, quite a bit, and uh, we, we've heard a lot of uh, abstract approaches to uh, doing quantum error correction and uh, fault tolerance. Uh, this tutorial will be about a much simpler approach to reducing decoherence. Uh, this is the, the technique of, of dynamically coupling. It's, it's not by itself a standalone complete solution, uh, but it uh, takes us uh, a ways towards uh, higher level error correction and, and fault tolerance. So uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, there was a, a really nice tutorial that was given by Lorenzo Viola four years ago, and uh, you can uh, go to uh, the website uh, and, and check it out. Uh, there's slides and a movie. Uh, so what am I doing here? Well, uh, I would like to uh, go a little beyond uh, what, uh, what Lorenzo covered uh, back, uh, back in the day. In fact, there has been progress in this field quite a bit. Uh, so I will cover some essential introductory material, and then I will talk about uh, things that uh, were not available four years ago. Uh, at least not at the level that they are today, and that's uh, high-order decoupling, dynamically coupling uh, two arbitrary levels of precision under, under certain, certain assumptions. And then I will also talk about decoupling along with uh, quantum computation. Okay, so the origins of, of dynamical decoupling uh, are with the Hans spin echo. Uh, that's uh, not a new field. It started 50 years ago, um, actually more than 50 years ago, uh, 1950. Uh, so here is Han uh, when he discovered the echo uh, in his young days. Uh, this is a more recent picture of his. And, and here is the echo. It's basically a uh, resurgence of, of quantum coherence uh, after decoherence has taken place. Uh, excuse me, let me try to fix this. It's kind of annoying. If I can at all. Uh, that's what happens when you run Windows on, on a Mac. I should have known better. Let's try one more time here. Yeah. That's right. Nope. All right. We'll have to live with it. Okay. So. <coughs> The, the explanation of, of the Han echo, which has to do with uh, getting uh, spins to, to Rico here, uh, has, uh, there's, there's a simple explanation. Uh, one can understand in terms of runners uh, running on a racetrack, uh, which each runner here actually represents a spin on the block sphere, if you'd like. So all the spins are starting out together, or all the runners are starting out together. And then they, they run at different speeds. Uh, each spin sees a, a different local environment. Uh, so, of course, after a while, they, they have completely uh, gone out of phase, but then what you can do is a simple trick. You can flip them all around, 180 degree pulse. Uh, so here I am, <coughs> leading this guy, <coughs> the only time I'll ever do it, but of course he runs a lot faster, so I'm out of luck, and he catches up with me, and here <coughs> we are back to the beginning. We've all recohered. There is uh, a uh, more precise way of looking at it, which uh, I stole straight from Wikipedia. Uh, you can go to the website. Uh, if you'd like, but this, uh, oh, it's, the, it's the same idea. Uh, there is a, uh, a collection of spins that are uh, all pointing along the, uh, uh, the north uh, pole. Uh, you perform a 90 degree pulse, flip them into the XY plane. They, they go out of phase. Uh, you apply a 180 degree pulse. They all flip around, and then the slow ones, uh, the fast ones catch up with the slow ones, and they all rephase at a certain point in time, at which, at which time you have the echo. So uh, all of this is, is to say the same thing. Uh, we can uh, rephase lost quantum coherence to some extent. Uh, here is a, a modern version of the, of the Han echo experiment uh, due to uh, Dieter Suter, who's, who's uh, with us today. Uh, here is the, the survival probability or the magnetization, if you'd like, of a uh, collection of, uh, of a, uh, of a uh, carbon-13 qubit coupled to uh, a proton uh, spin bath. And uh, if you don't do the Han echo, you observe this free induction decay, so uh, you lose coherence rapidly. Um, but if you apply the, the Han spin echo, you can restore to some extent 
And the point is that uh, this is only to some extent. And of course, uh, if the evolution time is short, then we get a lot of the coherence uh, back. But uh, if we wait too long, then the, the coherence decays, there's strong decoherence, and therefore uh, we're in trouble if we're trying to quantum compute. Uh, so much of, of what I want to talk about today is, is how we can extend uh, this coherence time uh, way beyond the, uh, uh, the, the rapid decay that you're seeing here. Okay, so it's time to get serious. Uh, so <coughs> I'll, uh, I'll introduce the formal setting. We have a Hamiltonian error model. So this is the, the non-Markovian noise model that uh, was described in an earlier talk. Uh, we have a, a system and a bath that evolve jointly under this noise Hamiltonian, H. And the, the noise Hamiltonian consists of a pure bath term, um, a, a free no noise system term. So this is the, the undesired terms in the, in the Hamiltonian. Um, and then there is, of course, the, the system bath interaction. And together, uh, these two are the things that uh, bother us. Uh, so I'm going to call that the error Hamiltonian. And the, the complete Hamiltonian is the sum of the bath Hamiltonian plus the error Hamiltonian, and it generates the unitary evolution operator. And so this evolution operator generated by the, uh, the error, uh, by the complete Hamiltonian, which includes the error and the bath Hamiltonian, is what, what I'm going to call free evolution. So far, we haven't applied any pulses. We haven't done any dynamical decoupling or ohanic or, or anything of that nature. All right, so now in, in this talk, I will assume uh, that all Hamiltonians are bounded in the operator norm. Uh, so uh, the operator norm is, is just the largest singular value or, or the, the largest eigenvalue for Hermitian operators. And so uh, the, uh, the norm of the error Hamiltonian I'll sometimes call J, the norm of the bath Hamiltonian is beta, and the sum of the two I'll, I'll call epsilon. Uh, but I have to say that this assumption of bounded Hamiltonians is, is not necessary for the analysis of uh, dynamical decoupling. Uh, and in fact, there are examples uh, where, of course, this assumption is, is violated. In particular, if you have an oscillator bath, uh, the norm of the, uh, the bath Hamiltonian, uh, as well as the system bath Hamiltonian, can, uh, can be formally infinite. Uh, so if that's the case, it doesn't mean that uh, we can't do dynamical decoupling. It just means that this type of analysis that I'm, I'm showing you here um, needs to be modified. And instead, one should use correlation functions and, and bath spectral densities and filter functions uh, and that is uh, indeed possible um, and will be covered, I believe, in Mike Bertrix and uh, Gonzalo Alvarez's uh, talks, that kind of approach to, to doing dynamical decoupling. But I will assume uh, for simplicity that uh, the, uh, the, the Hamiltonians all have bounded norm, and that actually does describe well situations involving spin baths as opposed to oscillator baths. Okay, so what is dynamical decoupling? Well, basically, dynamical decoupling is, is just kind of a, a rude way to treat the, the system bath. You just interrupt it all the time. Uh, what you're doing is you apply a set of instantaneous unitary operators, a uh, piece of J, only to the system. You apply pulses, unitary operations, at times T sub J uh, in between free evolutions. So here is the, the first pulse, uh, P0, then free evolution uh, for time tau 0. And then, again, another pulse and another free evolution, and another pulse, another free evolution, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, you have a unitary evolution operator for the system in the bath. But remember, the pulses are applied only, only to the system. So pictorially, uh, here is the first pulse, then a free evolution subject to the, the Hamiltonian, which includes the bath and the, and, the, and the air Hamiltonian. Another pulse, free evolution, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, <coughs> this is dynamical decoupling at the simplest level. All dynamical decoupling sequences uh, can be described in this so-called bang-bang manner, where we bang on the system with, uh, with these pulses. Uh, the, the only complication in more realistic treatments of dynamical decoupling is uh, when we have to include the, the fact uh, of life that pulses have finite width, in which case, of course, uh, you cannot treat these uh, the, the, the pulses as, as delta functions, as, as I'm doing here. But I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that uh, in this talk. And there will be talks, for example, uh, Lawrence of Violas and, and Dieter Suter's, uh, where this assumption will be relaxed. And of course, it's a, it's a very important thing to do to include finite pulse width effects. Everything I'm, I'm going to tell you in this talk is under this scenario. Do you see how simple this is compared to uh, the, the more elaborate constructions we, we heard about before? Uh, there is no topology, uh, there's, there's no braiding. Uh, at, at, at this point, in fact, there's not even going to be any encoding, although later on I to invoke some encoding. 
<coughs> so all it is really is just uh, uh, this idea of applying pulses, uh, certain types, uh, at certain intervals, uh, separated by certain intervals to the system. And, and that is supposed to, like in the Hahn spin echo experiments, supposed to restore coherence to the system. In fact, do more than restore coherence. We, we should be able to protect an arbitrary qubit, arbitrary qubit state. So uh, indeed, the, the way that different dynamically coupling pulse sequences different, different, differ is by the, the choice of pulse, ty pulse types and pulse intervals. All right, so for a qubit, typically we can pick pulses from the poly group, uh, identity, sigma x, sigma y, or sigma z. But we don't have to. We could, we could pick other uh, elements of SU2 as, uh, as our pulses. Um, and uh, the, the other important choice is the question of, of the pulse intervals. Th those are the degrees of freedom we have in this problem. It's desirable uh, to, es to optimize the choice of pulse types and the choice of pulse intervals. And this optimization is something that's been done and uh, I will talk about to, to some extent. Uh, so there are many examples and, uh, uh, well, uh, all these acronyms here, PDD, uh, RDD, CDD, et cetera. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about those in, in more detail. Uh, they, all these different acronyms refer to different choices of, of pulse types and uh, so in some cases also pulse intervals. So you, you buy yourself a lot by choosing different pulse types or different pulse intervals. All right, so uh, how good does dynamical, dynamical decoupling get? Well, here again is the, the general scheme. Uh, and this formula basically summarizes uh, what you can expect in general from dynamical decoupling. Right? So at, at the end of this evolution, when you have this unitary operator here at the final time t, you can always write it in this form. It's, it's a unitary, so I can always write it as the exponent sum uh, my i times the Hermitian operator. And uh, there's a sum of, of two terms. Uh, first, h naught here. h naught is the component of the original Hamiltonian that commutes with all the pulses. So if, if you have a piece in the original Hamiltonian that commutes with all the pulses, it's unmodified. All right, so Therefore, it just carries the original time scale t. But then you have contributions from uh, new terms, which did not commute with all the pulses. Therefore, they, they got modified. Uh, and these new terms, um, h, h sub alpha, effective, uh, each have a new time scale associated with them. So I'm just going to write that generically as t to the uh, n alpha plus 1. And n alpha is what we call the decoupling order of different types of errors, these, uh, these terms are, uh, are undesired, uh, so they're classified as errors, and we have different error types. And so the problem we, we want to solve in dynamical decoupling is a sort of a min-max problem. We would like to maximize <coughs> the smallest of these decoupling orders, which I'm, I'm just going to call n, uh, while minimizing the amount of work we have to do, which is the, the number of pulses that we're applying. Right, so for the least amount of work, the, the fewest pulses, I'd like to carry these errors to the highest possible order in time. That's what we'd like to do with dynamical decoupling. If, if we could uh, make this infinite, then, uh, then we'd be uh, very happy because then all we'd be left with is this, this term here, which we can design in such a way that it contains only harmless, uh, only harmless components or even useful components, such as components that allow us to, uh, to perform computation. So th this is the basic problem in dynamical decoupling. How do you maximize the order of, uh, of each of these errors uh, while minimizing the effort uh, in terms of the number of pulses? All right, so uh, I want to make a quick digression because the, these errors can be computed using uh, the Magnus of the Dyson series. So this being a tutorial, I thought it would be nice to, uh, to say a word or two about the Magnus and Dyson series. I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Dyson series. Magnus might be less familiar. Uh, you run into it when you start to study dynamical decoupling uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, NMR, ha average Hamiltonian theory in NMR. Uh, so <coughs> one of the technical tools that we use in this business is called the Magnus series. And uh, it is the, the following. Uh, it is a, uh, an approach to solving the first order linear differential equation, which is the Schrodinger equation for, for most of us but now in the, in, the, in the system bath setting, right? So uh, H is the, the Hamiltonian for the system bath, and it's time dependent because we've transformed into the so-called toggling frame where we're rotating with the pulses. So everything has become, uh, we're, we're, we're in this frame, we're rotating with the pulses, the Hamiltonian has become time dependent. Um, 
So while the, the Dyson series, familiar to, uh, to everybody, I'm sure, is, is an expansion as, as an infinite sum of the unitary operator, uh, the Magnus series is an expansion inside the exponential. And this uh, has nice features that I'll comment on in, in a moment. Uh, and you can, well, you can uh, write down what the, the terms are in the, in the Dyson series. This, this should be familiar. Uh, in the Magnus series, the, the terms of, uh, of this expansion rapidly grow more and more complicated. The first order term is easy. The second order is, involves one commutator. The, the third order involves uh, double commutators, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, there's, uh, there are, there's an explicit recursive recipe for writing down general terms in, in the Magnus series. Um, so it's, uh, technically, it's possible to, uh, in a sense, write down the whole expansion and, and certainly to bound it and, and do useful things with it. <coughs> yeah, and the two expansions are, are related. You can see that the, the first order term is the same, and the second order Magnus term can be related to the, the first two terms in the, in the Dyson series. Etc. That can be done for uh, for all for all terms. So the reason we, we care about the Magnus series in dynamical decoupling theory is because it preserves unitarity to all orders. Right? Be that's because the expansion is done inside the exponential, and that's that's a very useful feature. Uh, it allows us to uh, uh, to bound things in uh, in a nice way. Um, <coughs> It does have a limitation, which is that it has a convergence radius, unlike the, the case of the, the Dyson series. Uh, the a sufficient condition is this. The, the integral of the operator norm of the Hamiltonian uh, should be less than pi. That's, uh, that's a sufficient condition. Uh, so uh, technically, what this means for dynamical decoupling calculations is that, is that we, we cannot take the time here to be too large, which uh, it translates into uh, into the, uh, the dynamical decoupling uh, sequence uh, not being too long. Okay, enough with this digression on, on Magnus and Dyson. Now I want to talk about uh, the, the different pulse sequences that I, I mentioned earlier, and this is just a preview of, of what they do, uh, for what, what they buy us. So on the one hand, we have uh, the price we pay, which is just the number of, of pulses, and, and let me just talk about the single qubit case. Uh, it's already rich enough. So all we're trying to do here is protect a single qubit. The price we pay is just the number of pulses. K is the number of pulses. And the payoff, N, is the decoupling order, the, the minimum of, of all the decoupling orders in the expression that I, I wrote down before. Uh, so <coughs> the, the simplest of all sequences is called PDD, or periodic dynamical decoupling. And I'll, I'll talk about all of these in detail. But the, the simplest sequence uses up to four pulses. And what it buys you is a, a uh, decoupling order of one meaning that you, you remove the first order term in the Magnus series. And that's what the Hahn spin echo does. And that's why uh, the decay is so rapid. You can do a little better by uh, symmetrizing. Uh, uh, and basically, this means a time symmetric sequence where, or a palindromic sequence where you, you run this sequence uh, and its own uh, and a copy of, of it in, uh, in reverse. So uh, if you make a copy, well, then you double the price. Uh, and the payoff is that you go up to second order. So now you can, with a symmetrized version, this palindromic version, you can, you can uh, remove the first two orders in the Magnus expansion. Then there are uh, pulse sequences uh, which uh, can get you any order. So uh, you can go up to order, arbitrary order n, and the price you pay in the case of concatenated decoupling is exponential. This is a recursive construction. It has some similarities with concatenated error correction. Uh, just in the, in the sense that it's, it, it's concatenated, it's recursive. Uh, and then there is uh, a sequence called URIG dynamical decoupling, which uh, was introduced uh, several years ago. And it, it works just for a single error type. So for a single qubit, that means you can only remove, let's say, pure dephasing or, uh, or, or uh, pure amplitude damping, uh, uh, not general errors. Uh, so there, with just n pulses, uh, you can decouple to order n. And then there is an, an improvement of, of UDD, which allows you to uh, remove arbitrary errors on a single qubit. And with uh, order n squared pulses, you can get to order n. So that's, that's kind of the uh, exponential improvement in, uh, in the ability to, to do dynamical decoupling. Uh, of course, there are caveats. Uh, nothing is, nothing is, uh, uh, works under, under all conditions here. And the, the most important caveat is that, again, as I, I said, I had to assume that the uh, 
uh, operator norms are bounded. The Hamiltonian operator norms are bounded, which translates technically uh, viewed from uh, uh, in the frequency domain. It translates into a statement that the high frequency that uh, the high frequency cutoff of the Bath spectral density uh, is finite. Okay, so. Let me now talk about these uh, various decoupling sequences. Uh, <coughs> and let me start with the, the simplest one, PDD, periodic dynamical decoupling, which is this, the sequence that uh, with a constant number of pulses gives us first order decoupling. And, and again, this, this really is uh, an outgrowth of, uh, of the Hans spin echo. Um, the Hans spin echo can be described in, in this language. So, so let's say that we have a free evolution operator, uh, F I'm going to call it. Uh, we evolved the system and the bath together for some time tau. And now the construction is to uh, pick pulses uh, by design from a unitary symmetrizing group. So we, this is a group. It has elements G, G sub J, uh, unitary operators. Those are our pulses. And the way we're going to apply these elements is in this manner. So you just cycle over the group and you apply its elements uh, First the element, then its conjugate, et cetera, et cetera. And then you take this sequence and you repeat it. And that's, this repetition is why we call it periodic dynamical decoupling. So now we identify the pulses as the products of two successive group elements. Right, so this will be P1, uh, and Pj in general is uh, the, the inverse of pulse J minus 1, of element J minus 1 times, times the next element. And we also uh, identify uh, GK with, with G0. Okay, so now if you <coughs> uh, use the fact that you can move the, these unitaries up into the exponential, um, essentially a form of the Max expansion, or in this case it's actually just the baker campbell hausdorff type uh, calculation, you see that to, f to first order in tau, uh, T divided by K is, is tau, uh, you have this sum here. And then there are some, some second order corrections. And so clearly <coughs> what's happened is that we've taken the original Hamiltonian and we've transformed it into what I uh, called H naught before, uh, which commutes, indeed this term commutes with all the pulses. It's been symmetrized. This is a projection, technically it's a projection into the commutant of, of the group G. So this this kind of an expression indeed commutes with all the pulses, uh, so uh, it, uh, it deserves this, uh, this name H naught as, as before. Um, <coughs> this is the, the term that's first order in T, and then we have uh, these higher order terms uh, which uh, still act as errors, but the point is that we've gotten rid of things that don't commute with the, uh, the pulses to first order. All that's left is just this one term here that already commutes with all the pulses. Okay, so, so we have achieved first order decoupling. There's no order T term left that doesn't commute with, uh, with all the pulses. Uh, what are these high order terms? Again, you can compute them using the Magnus expansion or the Dyson expansion, but basically they involve commutators, uh, double and triple and higher order commutators of, of this form. Okay, so <coughs> in this language, what is the Hahn echo? Well, let's say that uh, the noise looks like this. Uh, typically, the Hahn echo is, is uh, described just for a pure dephasing, so when it was just a Z tensor B Z term. But let's, let's consider a general error Hamiltonian on a single qubit. For the Hahn spin echo, the decoupling group is just the two element group I and, and sigma X, let's say. Um, now you go through this construction where you identify what the pulses are, so you multiply the group elements and you find that there are uh, Actually, there's only one pulse. Uh, P1 is X and P2 is also X. So the pulse sequence, according to the, the previous construction then, where we write things in this way, the pulse sequence is just F, X, F, X. F is free evolution. Right, so we're doing free evolution, or let me read from right to left. Uh, we apply a pulse, free evolution, pulse, free evolution. That's, that's basically the, uh, the Han echo sequence. Or here, in, as a picture, apply the pulse, free evolution, pulse, free evolution. It takes total time two tau, two free evolution uh, segments. And when you write out the, uh, the unitary operator for the system in Bath, you see that <coughs> you have a first order term. The first order term is the thing that commutes with the group. Uh, obviously, x commutes with, with x, so uh, this one is not decoupled. And then you have higher order terms, 
And the important thing is that Y and Z got eliminated uh, from the first order. So uh, they only appear to, to second order. And I, I put primes here, which you can barely see, but uh, these are not the original bath operators. Of course, they get modified due to these commutators in higher order. So the point is that with the Han echo, we got rid of, of Y and Z, of sigma Y and sigma Z. We got rid of those errors to first order. Uh, there's a, an interesting connection, an important connection, in fact, with error detecting codes. Uh, you, uh, you see that, uh, in a way, the, uh, the errors that, that got removed to first order are the errors that can be detected uh, by this stabilizer group. And that actually is a way to, uh, to generalize uh, dynamical decoupling, which I'll, I'll say a little bit about later on. All right, so now <coughs> the next example, the so-called universal decoupling group, uh, that's when we are dealing with uh, when we want to protect a qubit against uh, an arbitrary system bath Hamiltonian on a single qubit. So we uh, expand the group. Now we, we have the polygroup. Rather than just uh, identity in X, we have identity I, X, Y, and Z. And now we, we, we do this multiplication, and we find that there are two pulse operators, uh, X and Z. Okay, so now the pulse sequence is this, Z, F, X, F, Z, F, X, F. That's the pulse sequence. And this pulse sequence has the interesting and important property that it completely decouples uh, a, a, a qubit uh, to first order from an arbitrary uh, system bath interaction. All right, so here, here again is the pulse sequence. Now it takes time for tau. And if you um, write the unitary operator, you see that the, the commuting term now is just identity. There's nothing left. Uh, the only thing that, that, that commutes with, with all four is, is identity. Um, so there are no errors left to, to her. There's nothing useful left either. There's nothing we can do with identity. Uh, but <coughs> there are no errors left at first order. All the errors appear to second order. So we've, we've completely decoupled this qubit to, uh, to first order. Every error has been detected by, uh, by, this, by this stabilizer group. Okay, so I've, I've dealt with uh, PDD uh, using four pulses, uh, or two in the case of the Han echo. Uh, we have decoupled to first order. Now let's move on to the symmetrized DD or palindromic uh, DD. Uh, and there's, there's a result that's been known for a very long time in the NMR community, uh, which is that any palindromic time reversal symmetric pulse sequence is automatically second order with respect to, to the base sequence that, that you're uh, time reversing. Uh, in fact, it's, it's better than second order. All even terms in the Magnus series vanish uh, if you make your control Hamiltonian time symmetric. This, this H here should be the control Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian generating the, uh, the pulse sequence. So with by symmetrizing, we can remove all even terms in the Magnus series, and therefore, <coughs> if we pick a sequence that eliminates first order, it automatically, in this construction, also eliminates second order, uh, and therefore we get um, a second order decoupling. So, so here is what it looks like. Again, same, uh, same noise model. Uh, the, this is the, the general single qubit error Hamiltonian. We take the same decoupling group, but now we take the pulse sequence and we also write it in reverse. And <coughs> uh, if you multiply the, the two Z operators here, uh, they cancel. So you've actually, you, you're left with two free evolution operators here. So this is, uh, in the middle, you have a, uh, a segment that takes time to tau. And that's, that's what's shown in this, in this picture here. All right, so now the total sequence takes time a tau. And uh, the unitary operator now uh, no longer includes second order term. Uh, so the, the first order term is just identity and everything else shows up to, to third order. All right, so we have second order decoupling uh, uh, for the price of making the sequence twice as long. Okay, so <coughs> that's not good enough because uh, we need to be able to get to arbitrary order. So how do we get to arbitrary order? There are basically two general techniques that I'm aware of for, for doing that. One is concatenation, which gives rise to concatenated decoupling, or CDD. And the other one is uh, pulse interval optimization, which gives rise to a, a whole new family of, uh, of pulse sequences. So concatenation goes like this. You want to think about the, uh, the error Hamiltonian, the noise, as some level zero type uh, error Hamiltonian. Okay, so that's why it has the, the superscript zero here, and we're, we're going to iterate it in some sense. Again, let's pick the, uh, the general single qubit uh, polygroup. 
as the decoupling group. And let's call the pulse sequence that we used before, the uh, ZFXF, ZFXF, let's call that pulse sequence P1. It's going to be the level one in the, in the recursion, in the, in the concatenation. Uh, so, so here it is again, same as before. Um, you've seen this already. But now let me think of, of this Hamiltonian that appears here uh, to second order. It's, it's actually, technically it's not a Hamiltonian because it doesn't have the right units because it's tau times t squared. But think of this operator, nevertheless, think of, try to think of it as a Hamiltonian, which has the same structure as the, the noise that we started out, the noise that we wanted to decouple. Right, so that suggests that if, if we somehow iterate this pulse sequence, we should be able to remove this just like we removed the original noise. Right? And so the way to do that is to insert the pulse into itself. Uh, inside every free evolution period, we're going to insert the same pulse sequence. Right, so written out as in pulse sequence language, rather than having a free evolution period, we take the original pulse sequence, P1, and stick it in between the original pulses. So this clearly is, is a first level recursion. And then uh, it's, well, it's hopefully it's already self-evident, but it can be shown rigorously that uh, this indeed removes uh, the second order term completely and leaves us just with a third order term. Everything has changed. Uh, the, 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 pure, the, the, the bath operator uh, has also changed. The air Hamiltonian here is now Air Hamiltonian superscript 2. Everything changes, but the important point is that the order in time has grown from 2 to 3 by, by this recursion. Why? Because it's, it's the same error model. Right? So what worked at the lowest level should work again if we concatenate. And so you, you can keep going. Um, <coughs> and this, w this is the general form of the recursion. Uh, and then if you do this to level k, you, you will have decoupled to order k. So the, the first non-trivial term that shows up is order k plus 1. So this uh, it, it can indeed be made rigorous, uh, this kind of construction. Uh, and uh, um <coughs> You can prove bounds and et cetera, but, but this, this really captures what's going on uh, with concatenation. You, you actually are able to, uh, to go to uh, arbitrary high order in time, provided here that I'm keeping the, the total time fixed. As, as this picture suggests, what I've done is I've fix the total time for which the pulse sequence evolves, and I perform the concatenation by shrinking the intervals tau. Right, so at every level of concatenation, I'm making the intervals shorter and by a factor of four uh, each time. And one may object um, correctly that, that this is, uh, in, in some sense, it's unphysical. I cannot keep making these, uh, these intervals shorter and shorter because uh, the shorter the interval, the more energy I need to, uh, to put in there. So another way to look at it is to say, uh, let's, let's keep the interval fixed and let's grow the total time. Right, so now the total time grows, like, uh, grows exponentially. Uh, and in this case, you find that there is an optimal concatenation level. At some point, uh, <coughs> depending on the parameters of the problem, at some point it, it doesn't help to, to concatenate any further because essentially the bath has, has, uh, has too much time to act and to, to inflict damage. Uh, and the, the optimal concatenation level uh, can be shown to be the uh, uh, inverse log of the norm of the air Hamiltonian plus the norm of the bath Hamiltonian times the, the fixed uh, pulse interval time. Right, so the, th this makes sense. Uh, the larger the, the norm of the air Hamiltonian, the smaller is the optimal uh, concatenation level and likewise for the, uh, the bath Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is concatenation and uh, what it does is for the price of using an exponentially growing number of pulses, you can, if you want, in other words, if you want uh, decoupling order n, you need to use an exponential number in n pulses to, to get there. Okay, so <coughs> this, this is nice, uh, but an exponential is not good. Uh, and so um, there is an alternative uh, way of looking at things. So far, what I've done is I've kept the pulse intervals constant. But what if we try to somehow optimize the pulse intervals? Right, is, does that buy us something? And the answer is yes, and this was uh, observed by, by Urig in, in the paper in 2007. Um, as I said before, first for the case of error, so let's say pure dephasing, 
And what he showed was that <coughs> using only order n pulses, we can already get uh, decoupling order n. So uh, there, will be, there will be several talks about this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but let me, let me give some background about it. Um, okay, so again, CDD concatenation requires an exponential number of pulses. Uh, can we do better? And <coughs> the, the optimization problem we want to solve is to maximize the smallest decoupling order while minimizing the, the number of pulses. Okay, so for purity phasing, URIG showed that we can do this with n pulses. And for general single qubit decoherence, as, as I'll argue briefly, uh, it can be done with, with n squared pulses. All right, and this is the, the construction, uh, the URIG construction. Um, this is not a proof that it works. It's just a, a way for you to visualize uh, how we choose, how we have to choose these pulse intervals. And, and proving that this choice intervals is optimal is, is non-trivial. Uh, there, there will be a couple of talks and posters uh, on that topic. So uh, the URIG construction, which buys us order n decoupling with only n pulses, uh, refers to, to this Hamiltonian, where we have purity phasing. Um, and the way that you choose the pulse intervals is, uh, has a very nice geometric uh, interpretation. So the, the pulse times, the times at which you apply the pulses, are, are given by this formula. Uh, so J here runs from 1 to N, uh, so that's the total number of pulses. And these are the times at which we uh, are supposed to apply our pulses. And, and what this formula means is nothing but the following. You, you draw a semicircle. And <coughs> you divide it into n plus 1 equal angles. Uh, each, uh, the, the, the first angle is uh, twice theta 1. Um, uh, the, the angles are, are given by, by, by twice this, uh, this so uh, j pi over n plus 1. And then you uh, drop down a vertical. Uh, and the points at which <coughs> these verticals in intersect the, the time axis, that's where you apply the pulses. All right, so uh, the, uh, how many pulses do I have here? Three, four. So the six-order URIC sequence uh, has pulses exactly at these, at these time intervals. Uh, at the lowest order, this actually reduces to what is known as a CPMG in the, uh, in the NMR community. Uh, so <coughs> so this, this is the way that uh, the, the URIC sequence works. Technically, you, uh, uh, you apply the pulses at, at these time points. And what that buys you is what it says here is the... Uh, uh, the unitary evolution operator now has the, the component that commutes, like before, to first order, but the component that we were supposed to decouple, the purity phasing term, now appears to order n plus 1. Provided you choose your, uh, your provided you apply your pulses at these, at these points in time. That's remarkable. Now, <coughs> uh, single uh, axis uh, errors are, are not the most general thing. How about general qubit decoherence, right? So how about the general error model? In this case, what we can do is we can basically use uh, the concatenation idea again. Um, we just have to concatenate or nest once. This is called quadratic uh, DD or QDD. And uh, we have to nest uh, two different types of, of auric sequences. So uh, geometrically, you can think of it as follows. Again, take the semicircle and just like before, divide it into n plus 1 angles. In, in this case, I'm going to call it n2 plus 1 equal angles because there are going to be two pulse sequences. So this is the outer pulse sequence. <coughs> uh, so apply x pulses at these moments in time. And the x pulses effectively will decouple sigma y and the sigma z uh, contributions to the, the error Hamiltonian. And then you take each of these intervals and draw another semicircle. And inside each one of these, you do the same thing. And this is where you're going to apply the Z pulses. Uh, so the, the, the points in time at which you apply the pulses are precisely where you see the, the red and the blue lines. So if you do this, you're guaranteed to essentially uh, get uh, uh, decoupling to order N1 plus 1. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, using n1 plus 1 times n2 plus 1 pulses, you're going to get decoupling to order min of n1, n2. Uh, so <coughs> this is a lot better than, uh, than using concatenation uh, because it's basically quadratic in the, uh, in the number of pulses, uh, whereas concatenation required an exponential. Uh, so this uh, will be given in a, 
a talk, I believe, by, uh, I hope I'm not wrong about uh, what Liang Zhang is going to talk about, but uh, a proof of this as well as a generalization uh, will be given in this talk. And in fact, <coughs> we can go further, and this is described in, in a poster by Wan Zhong Kuo. Uh, we can be much more specific than just to say what the, uh, that the decoupling order is the min of n1 and n2. We can actually analyze in detail uh <coughs> what the decoupling order is for each error. So if you want to know what, uh, if, you, if you apply x and z uh, the way as prescribed here, inner z pulses and outer x pulses, if you want to know to what order the error x is decoupled or y or z, uh, you can look it up in this table which, which will be described in, uh, in Wang's poster. Uh, and there are some interesting effects here due to uh, parity, uh, the, the relative parity of, uh, of N1 and N2. Okay, so now um, we've covered the uh, small piece of the, the pulse sequence zoo. Uh, so I've talked about uh, UDD and, and, and QDD, which are the, the UDD is, is provably optimal uh, for a single error uh, type decoupling. QDD is almost uh, optimal as far as we know from uh, numerical analysis uh, or symbolic algebra analysis, I should say. Uh, we know that uh, there basically there's a set of, of constraint equations that uh, can be checked and we can show that uh, it's uh, not possible to uh, achieve nth order decoupling with fewer than, or than, than n squared pulses up to, up to a constant. Uh, the proof of whether that is truly optimal is that's still an open question. So that's that's a really interesting question to uh, to try to attack. Uh, is it possible to do any better than uh, than order n squared um, for a general nth order decoupling of of a single qubit by uh, optimizing pulse intervals? That's an open question. Well, oh, how much time do I have more? Okay, good. <coughs> so. Before I start to talk about computation, uh, let me just show you the, uh, the battle of the, uh, the pulse sequences. Uh, so it's, it's as you'd expect. Uh, here, what I'm showing is numerical <coughs> simulations now. Um, I, I, sh I should have remarked that these results here, these are analytical upper bounds. Right? So the, uh, in real life, the situation may be better than the analytical upper bounds, and that's the purpose of these numerical simulations. Uh, so <coughs> what's being simulated here is a single qubit couple to a bath. Uh, the parameters are, are beta and j. The beta is the, the strength of the, uh, the pure bath term. j is the strength of the system bath coupling. So single qubit coupled to a bath. The bath operators are chosen as one or two uh, qubit operators. So uh, we have uh, uh, two body interactions and, and three body interactions here. Uh, these parameters uh, the R's are chosen at random, uniformly at random between uh, minus one and one. So that's the, the system bath model. And now we, we start applying pulse sequences, uh, the, all the different types. Uh, so we're doing PDD and, uh, and CDD, and there's another type here that I didn't talk about, uh, so let's ignore that, uh, and quadratic DD, QDD. Uh, and this, this is just a, a reminder of the cost that's involved in, in each one of these pulse sequences. What we're doing is we're actually applying a fixed number of pulses, and for each pulse number, let's say 100, we compute the log of the trace norm distance between the initial state that the system was in and the final state that the system was in. All right, so we have a single qubit, and we want to check to what extent it was preserved. This is the, the hard drive problem that uh, Andrew was talking about. All right, so we're just trying to store a qubit. So what you're seeing here is how well we were able to store this qubit as, uh, as measured by the distance between the uh, s initial and final state of the same qubit. Uh, and I should say that this is averaged over, not only over the, um, uh, the bath uh, parameters here, but also over uh, initial, um, initial system bath states. Uh, what we're doing is we're picking a random, a, a pure uh, initial, bath, uh, initial system bath state at random, and we trace out the bath, get the system state, and then we average over many such uh, choices of, of the initial system bath state. So uh, that's why you see the arrow bars here. Uh, there's averaging over all these random realizations. Okay, so <coughs> uh, the, the smaller the better. We would like the trace norm distance to be small. Uh, and so with, with PDD, uh, you see that the, uh, the error actually starts to, to increase as you increase the number of pulses. All right, so that's not good. Uh, the error starts to build up. The more pulses you use, uh, the, the larger the error. Uh, with the <coughs> techniques, uh, CDD, which is the purple line here, 
the arrow goes down uh, nicely. Uh, with concatenated URIG DD, it, it gets a little better. Uh, this is basically, uh, l let me not talk about this one. And the uh, QDD, the green line, you see that uh, the error goes down very fast. All right, so for using 50 pulses in this model, and by the way, this is, this is a small uh, simulation. It, it, it's a single qubit coupled to four other qubits. Uh, the bath is represented by, uh, by, by four other qubits, but we're actually solving the Schrodinger equation uh, in this entire uh, Hilbert space of, uh, of one system qubit plus four bath qubits. Uh, so see that, uh, for example, with 50 pulses, uh, well, the, these are the kind of uh, trace norm distances that, that you get. It's very, very small uh, with, with QD. It's, it's also small with the other ones, but the improvement is, is of course, uh, remarkable with QDD. So <coughs> the battle is won by QDD. That's the, <laughs> that's the message here. All right, so now in, in the remaining time, I would like to talk briefly about uh, uh, how we combine all this with computation. After all, as Andrew said, we want to do more than build hard drives. So the basic problem we're facing with using dynamical decoupling is that uh, dynamical decoupling pulses seem to interfere with the computation because uh, they, they cancel everything, uh, or at least they cancel everything uh, to the extent that they only leave the, the component that commutes with all the pulses. So how can we reconcile doing dynamical decoupling with doing computation? Uh, and I'm aware of at least three approaches. One is called decouple while compute. The other one is called decouple then compute. And the, uh, the last one is dynamically corrected gates, and Lawrence Viola will uh, give a talk about that on, uh, uh, at, at three today. So let me start very briefly, unfortunately for lack of time, uh, say a few words about uh, decouple while compute. Uh, it's it's uh, an approach that really works well uh, with, uh, with error correction uh, in, in some sense. Um, <coughs> so what we want when we do decouple while compute, what is decouple while compute? It's as the name suggests, we're doing decoupling and we're performing computation all at the same time. So in order for the decoupling not to ruin the computation, we, we need the pulses in the computation to commute. Right. And <coughs> uh, immediately solutions suggest themselves from, uh, from quantum error correction and from noise of subsystems. For example, we could use uh, a code and the stabilizer normalizer structure, or we could use the double commutant structure of, of noiseless subsystems. So specifically, what I mean with use stabilizer normalizer structure is, is this. Let's say that we pick our, our dynamical decoupling pulses as the stabilizer generators of a stabilizer code. So the, the stabilizers of the code are not things we're going to measure now in order to detect errors. Instead, we're going to apply these operators as pulses. If we apply them as pulses, they commute with the logical operators uh, of the code. And therefore, the thing that, uh, remember that H, H naught was the thing that commutes with all the pulses, what will be left <coughs> is precisely the logical operators of, of the code. So if, if we do this well, uh, we can achieve universal computation. Uh, because these logical operators now are terms in a Hamiltonian. They're not Okay, so the, uh, the, the universality constraints with the Clifford group and all that, uh, I need to rethink that because now these, these are terms in a Hamiltonian. So it's enough uh, to have uh, arbitrary single qubit and, and two, and uh, uh, it's enough to have single qubit and two qubit operators in the Hamiltonian in order to achieve universality. And that we can, uh, we can in fact construct for interests. So, so this is one idea. The, again, we're using dynamical decoupling pulses which are the stabilizer generators or the stabilizer elements of the code, and then the Hamiltonian that's left will consist of, will consist of the logical operators of the code. Uh, <coughs> alternatively, and this refers to this uh, noise and subsystem business, we could <coughs> use uh, dynamical decoupling pulses as, as collective rotations. So think of a, of a DFS. Um, the dynamical decoupling pulses are collective rotations. What commutes with collective rotations? Well, Heisenberg exchange interactions commute with collective rotations. So we can use this to, uh, to show that uh, we can, for example, perform high fidelity uh, gates, encoded gates for, uh, for quantum dots where Heisenberg interactions are, uh, are relevant. So that's all I want to say uh, very briefly about decouple while commute. It uses this commutation between the pulses in order to uh, achieve uh, the goal. Uh, and then, <coughs> 
Let me talk in a little bit more detail about the uh, decouple then commute approach, compute approach. So, so here we're doing the following. Here's a circuit. Um, and uh, let's say that we're actually trying to perform a, a fault tolerance simulation. Okay, so no dynamical decoupling yet. Uh, we, have, we have gates in a, in a fault tolerance simulation. Um, <coughs> let's divide the time steps into durations tau zero. Uh, and the gates themselves uh, take some, uh, some time. They have width, delta, uh, and we're going to put them at the end of, of each time interval. So the, the full Hamiltonian is the, uh, the, the, the air Hamiltonian plus the bath Hamiltonian plus the, c the control in this case is what implements the gates. So I'm, I'm thinking about this at a uh, purely Hamiltonian. And it's too bad that this is covered now because this is a really important line. <laughs> uh, so <coughs> in fault tolerant, uh, in, in fault tolerant uh, quantum computation, and in, in particular in the context of the accuracy threshold theorem, we, w we are interested in the noise strength. So this is eta is the noise strength, which is the norm here of uh, the air, of, yes, of the air Hamiltonian multiplied by tau zero. Okay, so eta is the norm of the air Hamiltonian times tau zero. That should be less than the, um, the threshold, which let's say is 10 to the minus four. So if this quantity, which we call the noise strength, the norm of the air Hamiltonian times this time interval is less than the threshold, then fault tolerance simulation is possible. Okay, now how can we improve this using dynamical decoupling? All right, so far there's no dynamical decoupling. Is there a way to make things better using dynamical decoupling? And the answer is yes, sometimes. Um, let's <coughs> modify the circuit so that every gate is preceded by a sequence of dynamically coupling pulses. Right, so we're going to make the circuit longer. Uh, instead of having uh, gates separated by intervals tau zero, we make our gates separated by intervals capital T, which is n times tau zero, and I'm sorry, this should have been <coughs> k, actually, to be consistent with my previous notation. So T is k times tau zero, where k is the number of pulses uh, in the dynamically coupling sequence. So it's, it's a very simple idea, uh, conceptually. We simply replace each gate by a pulse sequence, then the gate. Right, so this is what we call dynamical decoupling protected gates. All right, so now we know from the, the previous results that uh, if we choose a, uh, the, for any pulse sequence, or if we choose it well, uh, <coughs> we can get a high decoupling order here. All right, so at, at the end of the pulse sequence, um <coughs> we will have removed much of the noise, and it, the, the gate sees an effective system bath interaction that is, whose strength is much reduced. That's the basic idea. So the new noise strength, let me read this off. This is eta dd, right? So unlike the, the previous eta you couldn't see, this was the, uh, the pure eta, which was norm of the air Hamiltonian times time. Now it's the norm of this new Hamiltonian here times the time it takes to implement the pulse sequence plus the gate, and that quantity has to be smaller than the, uh, than the threshold. All right, so under the right conditions, this, this effective Hamiltonian will have a very small norm, and even though you have to multiply it by a longer time, this number eta dd here can be than if you didn't do dynamical decoupling. All right, so so the, the idea is, again, reduce the noise by applying the, the sequence, and <coughs> uh, if that's better than uh, not doing the sequence, uh, then you gain something. So let me skip this. Uh, although I want to advertise Gerardo's talk, he was, was going to relax an important assumption that was made in, in this analysis called the local bath assumption. Um <coughs> so just to show you how, uh, how much improvement we get, uh, here is uh, a graph uh, that shows the relative noise strength, right? So uh, the noise strength in the presence of dynamical decoupling versus the noise strength without dynamical decoupling uh, as a function of epsilon tau zero. Epsilon was norm of the air Hamiltonian plus norm of the bath Hamiltonian. So in these units, <coughs> if eta dd is less than eta, below this line, then dynamical decoupling helps. If we're above this line, dynamical decoupling hurts. 
And so you see that uh, <coughs> there are two pulse sequences here, the uh, uh, XZ, XZ sequence and the palindromic sequence. You see that we can easily get below the level where dynamically coupling hurts uh, into the regime where, where it helps. We have a lower effective uh, noise strength uh, for the circuit and this, this means that fault tolerant uh, simulation might become possible where it was previously not possible. Uh, <coughs> Or, uh, in, in other words, if ADD dips below the, uh, the threshold level, uh, then fault tolerance simulation becomes possible wh where it was not possible without doing dynamical decoupling. Um, it this also improves the, uh, the overhead uh, quite a bit. I don't, don't have that graph to show you, but I can give you the reference if you're interested. Uh, the overhead is, is reduced very significantly, uh, provided we're in this regime. And then finally, what if we use a balance, or what if we use concatenated decoupling? Now the uh, when we use the optimal level of concatenated decoupling, because we, we have a finite uh, uh, pulse interval, uh, so we're, we're in this regime where we have to uh, worry about using the optimal level concatenation of the pulse sequence, you see that the reduction in the noise strength uh, is quite dramatic, well, for the right parameters, um, relative to uh, not doing uh, <laughs> dynamical decoupling protected gates. Uh, again, this is for the uh, XZ, XZ se sequence is the blue line and the red line is uh, the palindromic version of, of the same sequence. So, so what these results show is that using dynamical decoupling uh, in conjunction or, or doing quantum error correction, fault tolerant quantum computation in conjunction with dynamical decoupling can actually uh, help quite a bit provided we're in the, in the right parameter regime. Uh, it can, in particular, it can reduce the noise strength uh, in some cases to below the, the threshold level, in other cases uh, where we were already below the threshold level, it can improve the, uh, the amount of overhead that, that we need uh, to perform the simulation. So let me, this is my last slide, let me uh, sum it up. In some sense, <coughs> doing dynamical decoupling is trying to fight decoherence with, with your hands tied because uh, this is a method uh, where all you do is you apply these control pulses uh, and it's, it's open loop. It doesn't use feedback and doesn't use measurements. Uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, there, there is an extra resource uh, out there, which is doing feedback, doing measurements uh, in order to, uh, to improve uh, performance. But here we're saying, let's not do that. Okay, uh, so why? Uh, <coughs> why? Why do that? Well, uh, in fact, uh, you might argue that it's not a good idea because dynamically coupling is is not a standalone solution. Uh, it cannot by itself be made fault tolerant. Uh, I believe uh, Kaveh Hoja uh, talked about that on, on Thursday. So why do we do it? Why do we tie our hands behind our, back, behind our backs? Uh, and the answer is, uh, first of all, this open loop approach is technically easier. Uh, I think that should be clear. Uh, applying a pulse sequence is easier than, uh, than braiding. Uh, <coughs> or uh, even uh, just doing feedback, performing measurements and, and feeding back on information acquired through measurements. So it, technically it's easier. Uh, we've also seen that we can use dynamical decoupling at the lowest level to improve performance, uh, maybe even uh, get below uh, threshold and uh, reduce overhead. And finally, uh, what I really like about this uh, approach of dynamical decoupling is that it, it is ready uh, for experiments. Uh, in fact, there have been plenty of experiments uh, testing dynamical decoupling, and the results are, are nice, and uh, they're encouraging, uh, and I think we're going to hear quite a bit about that later. So with that, I'll thank you. Questions? Uh, uh, Daniel, in, in between uh, feedback and measurement, there's the possibility I would think of having some more knowledge about the Hamiltonian and therefore making use of the extra space in the free evolution for robust control, let's call it, still open loop. So you have any ideas as to what that extra knowledge might look like? Um, <coughs> if you're referring to uh, real-time acquiring of this extra knowledge? No. Oh, you mean offline? Prior. Prior. Yeah, I I agree with you 100% and in fact uh, there will be a talk about that very subject, uh, how to use dynamical decoupling to uh, learn the bath spectrum. Uh, so yes, uh, that information can be acquired even using dynamical decoupling and 
if you, if you know something about the bath, for example, if you know the spectral density, the shape of the bath spectral density, uh, you can do extra optimization. Uh, the only assumptions that I needed for, for this presentation were these assumptions that the, the, nor the Hamiltonian was norm bounded. But I didn't use any particular details other than that uh, about the bath spectrum. If you know it, you can optimize further. That's true. Uh, I have a question about your decouple, then compute, or dynamic DD protected gates. I mean, you, you showed that you can actually improve by making it longer and applying some gates, but mm -hmm. I assume you assumed that the gates are perfect. In other words, they have no errors. Is that right? No. <laughs> no, that. Uh, well, no, I, my assumption yeah. is wrong, or? Uh, the gates have errors. The gates are allowed to have errors. And this, okay. this is part of a, a fault tolerance simulation. So the gates are allowed to have errors. What the little cheat in this graph is that um, actually the, it doesn't go down forever. I mean, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, what's being plotted here are these formulas. And you see that there is a, a lower bound. And the lower bound involves delta, which was the time it takes to implement the gate. OK, so uh, actually there is a floor here. Uh, which is, is given by, uh, by this left-hand side. Uh, so the, the, the error that you're asking about is basically the error associated with the gate and it's, uh, that's measured crudely by the parameter delta, the width, the time it takes to implement the gate. Well, I would not call that an error. I mean, well, it, it could yeah. still be perfect, <coughs> but finite duration. Right, right. So the error is, is measured in terms of uh, that times um, let's say the, uh, the the norm of the air of the air Hamiltonian on the gate. Okay, so but the gates them I mean the the gates the pi pulses they themselves are considered to implement exactly a pi pulse, for instance. R right, right. No, so it's 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 the same thing. Uh, it's uh, this this parameter delta here, delta times j. Uh, is the strength, the, the noise strength associated with a gate or with a pulse. And uh, N is the, the number of pulses, so it, it gives you kind of a cumulative uh, error associated with applying uh, N faulty gates or pulses of finite width. Yes, uh, Daniel, I have a question regarding the Uric pulse sequence. So as, as you mean, it works excellently under the assumption that the norm is bounded, or in our language, that the um, power spectrum of the bus has a cutoff. And of course, all experimentalists, including ourselves and many people here, try the Uric system on natural noise sources. And it, as far as I remember, only the Bollinger group who introduced artificial noise and put a cutoff and showed Uric works, works better. All the other examples, it doesn't work better. So, uh, so it seems that this is a crucial assumption for the URIG, and my question is, in what sense the assumption that you use for the other pulse is crucial for the other pulse sequence you mentioned? Bounded norm. Yeah, so uh, first of all, regarding the URIG sequence, uh, yes, uh, it, this, this will work for the right experimental system. As, as you said, in the language of uh, spectral densities, there needs to be a, a cutoff. Uh, and one can think of interesting solid state examples where there is. Uh, so I, I, I think it is a useful sequence uh, in that context. Uh, as for whether the other sequences depend on uh, there being a sharp cutoff, uh, actually the, the concatenated sequence is not nearly as sensitive. Uh, this, this assumption here was, in this presentation, was made just for convenience. But the same analysis can be done uh, in the language of, of spectral densities, and you see that the, the spectral dens the, the, f the cutoff does not enter in quite a dramatic way as, uh, as in the Ori case. I mean, it, it all boils down to, um, as we'll see in Mike Birchick's talk, uh, applying a filter function which suppresses low frequency noise. Uh, and uh, if the filter function is very flat, which is what the Ori sequence is, it basically is multiplying the low, low frequency part of the spectrum. Uh, by a very flat function and pushes everything to high frequencies, then you get the strong dependence on the, on the cutoff. Uh, but you can come up with alternative functions, and concatenated decoupling is, is an example of that. It's not necessarily the best example for a bath with a, uh, a soft tail 
which doesn't suffer from, uh, from the cutoff problem as much. I got a question about the slide <coughs> where you compared uh, the various scheme for single qubit um, and their complexities, uh, the com complexity versus the de decoupling order. Right. Uh, I wonder how uh, randomized schemes uh, fit into the picture. The, the schemes you had, they, they seem to be all deterministic. I yes. wonder what you could buy like with a randomized sequence, which decoupling orders you might achieve. Right, uh, so I uh, did not talk about uh, the randomized uh, sequences. Um, Oh, excuse me. Uh, for lack of time, uh, they are they're important. They're uh, uh, they're relevant, uh, and they they're important and relevant, especially for uh, baths that have uh, fast time dependence. Uh, if the bath is has a strong time dependence, which basically means that the uh, in this language it means that the the norm of the bath Hamiltonian, the pure bath Hamiltonian, is large. In an interaction picture, you can think of the bath as rotating fast then. Uh, many of these uh, optimized tailored pulse sequences don't work because basically the, whatever sequence you're trying to apply, at the next step, uh, the bath has changed so much that uh, the order got scrambled. And in that case, you might as well just do random decoupling. So that's the context for random, de random decoupling. Now, as far as the order, uh, I believe that the, the answer is that it's, it's a fixed order that you can achieve. I'm not aware of a, a randomized scheme that achieves arbitrary order, but perhaps Lorenzo would like to comment on that. Well, uh, it's a bit tricky to define what the order of suppression is for uh, randomized decoupling schemes because they don't naturally lend themselves to Magnus type analysis, but um, um, from my own experience, the uh, other feature that they have is that they become most uh, powerful in many qubit settings for which the decoupling group uh, is an appreciable and the larger size it has the better because what randomization buys essentially is a square root improvement in the time for traversing the group. So there have been a lot of uh, numerical evidence that uh, um, indicates that there can be significant um, advantages in using randomization for long times and large scale systems and I plan to revisit that myself at some point. Um, I don't know if we are going to be stuck to low order. I think it is possible to achieve high order. Uh, just because, um, you know, uh, we know that uh, uh, good deterministic schemes exist. So randomization in some sense cover all the possible paths um, and it must cover a high order as well. But uh, uh, for that I don't have a, a good answer as of now. It's an open problem. <laughs> so should we <clears throat> thank all our morning speakers again? And <laughs> Lunch is upstairs, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Would you like to be? No. Okay. <laughs>